This is the first event that the Rain Williams Foundation is um, holding for the centenary, first of several events. Um, but we've already been preparing by um, commissioning some resources for the centenary. And if you go to, if you're interested in those, if you go to the website, the Rain Williams Foundation org website um, you'll see that there'll be some, there's some explainers there and there are several there are um, a collection of original new interviews with people um, who have either known or been highly influenced by Rowan Williams's work throughout their life um, and you may want to have a look at those and also straight after this meeting it's worth saying that if you haven't heard about it already the Raymond Williams Society our sister organization is um, hosting a screening of um, border country at the Ray Williams film Border Country, and you you, know, you can um, you can register for that. If you go to their website or their Twitter feed, you can join that event still, and that starts at nine. So just after that event, you'll be able to grab a cup of tea and go and join the screening. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Sharon now, um, who's the other coordinator with uh, of Ray Williams Foundation. She's going to say a few words before we start the readings. Yeah, good evening, everybody. It's great to be here and it's fantastic to see so many people here too. Um, <clears throat> just a very few words, really. I uh, just wanted to support Nick's point about the fact that we've been trying, we've been working all this year, at least, towards creating a series of explainers, um, a series of interviews about what Raymond Williams has meant to various people. But also just to say something about the ethos of the Raymond Williams Foundation, which, as you know, I'm sure has been focused in particular on adult education. And that's been a, a huge influence on many people. Um, as you all know, Raymond Williams brought much of his thinking as an adult educator to bear in his development of cultural studies, that ethos of interdisciplinarity. And I just wanted to reflect on just a couple of very, very brief points before we hand over to the speakers uh, and to pull out a couple of key quotes from several places that have been really important in work that we're doing at the moment in, in various ways through the RWF but, and in um, research circle that I'm involved in at, in my work context, just to say that we, we pick three or four key points really. One is, uh, this is a quote that we think is, is, is vital and fundamental to the ideas behind adult education, and that is, there are ideas and ways of thinking with the seeds of life in them, and there are others, perhaps deep in our minds, with the seeds of a general death. Our measure of success in recognising these kinds and in naming them, making possible their recognition, they may be literally the measure of our future. And I think that ties into the idea of uh, the idea of radicalism being about making hope possible rather than despair convincing, which was another very important quote in Raymond Williams' Resources of Hope. And we, we feel that that can be done in many ways through the very best aspects of adult education. And I, I love this quote, which is from Williams uh, from around 1983. And it said, adult education is not about remedying deficit, making up for inadequate educational resources in the wider society. And nor is it primarily a message to meeting new needs of the society. It has to be more than the bottle with the message in it, bobbing on the tides and waves of history. Instead, it should be about making learning part of the process of social change itself. And I think we genuinely try to embody that the idea of the limitations of representative democracy and this move towards a dem democratic education and a participatory model of education. And, and that's really all I wanted to say. So I shall hand back to Nick and we'll hear from the speakers. Thank you. Thanks, Sharon. We, we've got um, nine fantastic speakers um, who have picked their extracts coming up now. Um, so the way this evening, the rest of this evening is going to work, we're going to have around an hour of, um, from them, probably a bit less. But we've asked them to keep to a maximum of five minutes each. So if we do that, we'll, we'll be able to keep to that time. And then the remainder of the event um, will, be, will be for um, reflections um, and a bit of discussion, really. So to reflect collectively on what, how the readings resonate with us and how we can build on the fantastic legacy of Raymond Williams. So um, without further ado, I'm going to hand over now to Colin Thomas. Colin's um, 
film director and she produced a fantastic film, um, directed a fantastic film, Border um, Country, about Raymond Williams. Um, and so I'm going to hand over to Colin now. Thanks, Colin. Thanks, Nick. Um, the excerpt I'm going to read is from Raymond Williams' first novel, Border Country. Uh, and uh, the extract that I'm going to read is a description of an Eisteddfod in the fictional village of Glynmawr. Uh, it seems to me to convey the strength of the culture that Raymond Williams grew up with and the culture that was then belittled and patronised when he moved to Cambridge. <clears throat> Will did not want to go in, but the dark evening was settling, holding the valley, and it was suddenly colder, so he went in. Now in the close atmosphere, the crowded, oil-lit room, the tension was immediate. Tenors, baritone, sopranos came and went, all developed in face and in stance, as well as in voice, used to travelling from distant villages and from the mining valleys. The recitations came next, and here there were more people from Glynmawr itself. Many of the farmers, ordinarily slow, inarticulate men, recited regularly. On the little platform, under the single oil lamp, they became intent and strange in the practised formal eloquence, which was warmer, more pressing on the heart than this, even the singing. Will kept his eyes down. At the moving of voice, he could accept it. But what was difficult always was to look up and see the man himself. Ewan Davis, Josh Evans, Evan Priest. It was time now for the choirs. And Will knew, looking up, that it was of no use at all, even trying to keep separate. Each choir moved into position, into dark, settled rows. And the set faces turned to the conductor, eyes widened and lips poised. Men and women surrendered, asking for movement and control. The drop of a raised hand, and then not the explosion of sound that you half expect, but a low, distant sound. A sound like the sea, yet insistently human. A long, deep, caressing whisper pointed suddenly and sharply broken off, then repeated at a different level, still both harsh and liquid, knocked off again, cleanly. Then, irresistibly, the entry and rising of an extraordinary power, and everyone singing, the faces straining, and the voices rising around them, holding, moving in the hushed silence that held all the potency of these sounds, until you listening were the singing, and the border had been crossed. When all the choirs had sung, everyone stood and sang the national anthem, my hair and rod from that eye. It was now no longer simply hearing, but a direct effect on the body, the skin, on the hair, on the hands. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. That was wonderful. We're now going to hear from Rianne Jones, the broadcaster, um, critic and writer Rianne Jones. Are you there, Rianne? Uh, yes, I'm here. I hope you can all hear me all right. Yep, that's great. great. I can hear you fine. Okay. Uh, the extract that I've picked, I think, follows logically from uh, Collins, who mentioned Williams at Cambridge. Um, I've got an extract from Politics and Letters, which is a collection of interviews that he did with New Left Review throughout the 70s. Um, and in this extract, he talks about his time studying English at Cambridge and uh, EMW Tilliard, uh, Eustace Mandeville Wettenhall Tilliard, to give him his full glorious title. Um, I, I picked this because it expresses the fact that despite the confidence and the ground, groundedness that Williams took from Wales, um, and, and when attending Cambridge as a working class student, I think he wrote that the ancientness of Cambridge didn't intimidate him because he knew that the history of his part of Wales predated the history of Cambridge. 
Um, but despite this, in practice, he did struggle quite a lot with this particular academic environment and his teaching methods and with trying to juggle his studies and his political activity. Um, and he suffered quite deep bouts of self-doubt and anxiety, which um, are perhaps difficult to square with the confidence of his written ideas. Um, and he's very honest about that year, as he often was. Um, I think this extract is also uh, very humorous in some ways. Uh, it's quite lacerating in its self-deprecation and in its frustration with a certain kind of academia, which is uh, a side of Raymond Williams that we are perhaps less familiar with. So uh, I hope you find it interesting. So the interviewer asks him uh, what was his experience of English studies in 1939 to 1940. And he replies, in the first year, it was not particularly problematic. We were mainly doing the earlier periods of English literature in a relatively formal way. I found it basically a continuation of schoolwork. Precisely because it did not go much later than Pope, it did not raise any acute problems for me. My tutor was Lionel Elvin, who was on the left, although not a communist. He knew I was one when I attacked Pope's verses for aristocratic frigidity, which he told me would not do. Otherwise, we got on well enough, as I wrote the sort of essays one did about Shakespeare and the energy released by the emergence of the bourgeoisie. But in my second year, I was transferred to Tilliard. Of course, as soon as I said anything like that to Tilliard, the atmosphere became very difficult. We started doing the novel, and I promptly produced the party orientation, that it was necessary to see any bourgeois novel of the past from the perspective of the kind of novel that must now be written in the present. Tilliard told me this was not a tenable procedure. It was a fantasy. How could you judge something that had been written from the perspective of something that hadn't? Not only was I hostile to Jane Austen and interpreted Dickens or Hardy in a very simplifying way as just progressive, but I would also talk about the romantic poets, insisting that they represented a project of human liberation, which was going to be completed in the future. Then he would say it was nothing to do with literature if some process was going to be completed or not. In my first year, the habits of schoolwork had held. God knows how I found the time with all the other things I did, but I used to prepare my essays and do my reading very thoroughly. In the second year, however, we were given so much else to do that the whole situation became at once that much more demanding and disintegrating. My work got very scamped. In part, this was the typical problem of a socialist student of literature, as I have since experienced it. In any situation with a supervisor, you're going to be damned lucky if you know anywhere near as much as he does. If you get involved in a tough argument, if he wants, he is going to be able to put you down because he can always think of examples that you have not read. How do you square that account of Dickens with, then up comes a title or author that you may not even have heard of. It is very easy for a teacher to use his superiority in that way. In my case, I was involved in constant political activity and other kinds of writing, practical priorities that were in keeping with my theoretical principles. In that sense, I was living in totally good faith. But in my academic studies, I was not able to produce the properly prepared and referenced and coherent work that I knew I needed to defend my positions. I was continually found out in ignorance, found out in confusion. That hit every habit of my school training. There was a tremendous frustration at realizing that I did not know enough to win the arguments. You must remember that a hell of a lot of my self-image was devoted to the notion that I could handle academic work. It now became clear to me that actually I could not. In that situation, the easiest way to respond, and one saw it again throughout the 60s, was to say that all that was pedantic crap, that my God, there was a war going on. It was not a very intelligent thing to say because Tilliard merely replied, why then are you against the truth is that for the first time in my life, I looked at myself with a radical doubt. I did not feel very pleased. Nobody could construe from reading my published works the sort of person I then was. So it was a total mess of a situation. At the same time, it did seem pretty irrelevant because you knew that you were going into the army in a few months and it seemed improbable that anything would eventuate from all this in any case. I was continually reminded of this time in the casualties of the contradictions and struggles of the 60s. In May and June 1941, I was one like that. It was a very sharp difference from my mood before that. I did not have anything as definable as a breakdown, but the situation was more than I could handle. The whole crisis had an important bearing on my attitude when I returned to academic work in 1945. 
People often ask me now why I didn't carry on then from the Marxist arguments of the 30s. The reason is that I felt they had led me into an impasse. I had become convinced that their answers did not meet the questions and that I had got to be prepared to meet the professional objections. I was damn well going to do it properly this time. Here we are. That was fantastic again. Next, I'm going to hand you over to Rhiannon White, who's co-artistic director of the theatre company Commonwealth. Rhiannon, are you there? Yeah. Can you hear me all right? Yes. yes. Perfect. Uh, freedom is duty, 1978. We can think of the question of freedom and duty in art as a problem of balance. So much freedom against so much duty. A perpetual dialogue on the relations between these two apparently opposite qualities. I would not want to dispute the usefulness of that kind of argument. In many specific situations it is necessary. But I would like to say first, not merely in a paradoxical mood, that in an important sense the first duty of the artist is to be free and that the first duty of social provision in the arts is to ensure freedom. It is necessary to say this because in very different conditions, that freedom is now a very considerable threat. Typically the kind of threat that is cited is the characteristics of societies other than our own. Thus in the capitalist West, we are very aware, rightly and necessarily aware of threats to the freedom of the artist from authoritarian political systems administrative measures and censorship and various kinds of legal and political control. I believe as strongly as anyone that we must denounce those kinds of interference and show solidarity with all those who suffer from such interference. But just because I feel so strongly, I'm aware also of the limitations on freedom in quite a different kind of society, such as our own, where the problems are those of commercial viability. There is, of course, a not inconsi inconsiderable area of difficulties of a more political and legal kind. But I am thinking of the commercial constraints primarily, where you can say that at times freedom in our society amounts to the freedom. Um, but I can say the commercial constraints primarily where you can say that at, at times freedom in our kind of society amounts to the freedom to say anything you wish, provided you can say it profitably. That is to say, there is no problem about saying anything or writing anything except in the sense of finding normal distribution, normal working conditions. There is a deep correlation with profit, and this does impose constraints of a certain kind. In neither of those situations, neither that of authoritarian political pressures nor that of commercial pressure, does an artist want to hear from one kind of person about duty. Because duty is often simply the name for the exertion of that pressure the duty to serve the state or serve the cause, the duty to entertain the public or to write something that they want to read, which usually means something that fits somebody's marketing prediction about what others want to read. Against all these restraints on the artist's freedom, we have to be very firm. The philosophical defense of the freedom of the artist can be made in terms of his rights as an individual or of his rights as an artist. I don't want to dispute either of these defenses, although they are not the way in which I would primarily put things myself. I think that the need for freedom in the arts is above all a social need. I think that the very process of writing is so crucial to the full development of our social life that we do, in an important sense, need every voice. The extreme complexity of any historical and social process being lived out in a particular place at a particular time, the extreme complexity of the interaction of individual lives with all those general conditions means that you can never at any time say that you've had enough voices or that you have enough representative voices or that anybody can say in advance what are the important things either to be said or to be written about. This need for many voices, voices is a condition of the cultural health of any complex society. And so the creation of conditions for the freedom of the artist is in that sense, the duty of society not for the sake of any individual artist and not in terms of some abstract argument about rights, but simply because society needs all the articulated experience and all the specific creation it can get. Thank you. Thank you, Rhiannon. Thanks so much. Um, I think we're starting to really tune in now to Raymond. I think that it's 
takes a special kind of listening, doesn't it? Just as it takes a special kind of reading. Um, I'm going to hand over next to David Anderson, the Director General of National Museums Wales. David, are you there? I am, thank you, yes. Um, I'm going to read from um, the uh, article Welsh Culture from 1975. Um, I would just like to say first though, that I feel as though we're meeting together on what could be called almost Raymond Williams Day. I think we shouldn't just have one, one occasion, one birthday that we mark, but every, every year. And for me to read his words um, is almost like to breathe the air that, that he breathed. Um, it's a privilege to, to speak in his words. I chose this article um, initially because it refers in part to St. Fagans Museum, which is part of the Ungather Cymru um, family of museums. Um, not entirely flatteringly, it has to be said, it was the museum of 50 years ago, but some of the critique I'm sure some people would think would still, still apply. Um, more importantly though, I chose it for what it says about the public representation of culture, and because of its conclusion um, that people have to, in the end, direct their own lives, control their own places, live by their own feelings. So this is extracts from Welsh Culture 1975. When we hear the word culture, some of us reach for our fancy dress. Real life is home, family and a job, wages and prices, politics and crisis. Culture then is for high days and holidays, not an ordinary gear, but an overdrive. So if you say Welsh culture, what do you think of? Of Badabrith, of the Estedford, of choirs and Cardiff Arms Park? Depopulation, unemployment, exploitation, poverty. If these are not part of Welsh culture, we're denying large parts of our social experience. And if we have shared these things with others, that sharpens the question. Where is it now, this Wales? Where is the real identity, the real culture? It's worth walking with this question around the Folk Museum at St. Fagans. It's a lovely place. Along the paths and under the trees, are the re-erected farmhouses and cottages of the periods and regions of Wales. Inside the houses are the old furniture, the old utensils, the old tools. You can touch the handle of a shovel and closing your eyes feel a life connecting with you, the lives of women and men whose genes we still the labour now dissolved into what may seem a natural landscape of high field and culvert and lane. It is all there, you say, the real Wales. And then you look up at the big house on the in whose park this image, so precisely material, has been built, reconstructed. It is not that it cancels the decency or the dignity of the farms and the cottages, but it's there all the time, as another part of the, the castles of Wales, most of them the monuments of an invading and occupying political system. Are they too part of Welsh culture? Even the steam locomotives, once they were running, became a cultural attraction. It's very hard to hold this imbalance. The feeling for the past is more than a fancy, but it's how past and present relate that tells in a culture. If you forget the past and think about the future for a minute, you can see this whole model, the uneconomic collieries, the out-of-date heavy industry, the marginal farms. The region that say, said has obvious tourist and leisure potential, and that arose is where the culture comes in again as a resort and a festival both meticulously and distinctively Welsh. But this is the problem, the real problem of cultural identity. I wish I could see it in one of its popular forms, in a kind of emphasis on Welshness against an alien and invading culture, consequent emphasis on culture as tradition and on tradition as preservation. I can feel easily the strength of that position. The language spoken and written since the success still a native language for a significant minority and to want to keep it to insist on keeping it as natural as breathing with the language goes a literature and with the literature a history and with the history a culture it's a real enough model as far as it goes the language wasn't only driven back by the industrial revolution and its movements of people it was also driven back by conscious repression by penalty and contempt and in the latter phase by deliberate policy in the schools it is bound to be wrong to forget or forgive that. It is bound to be right to use and to teach a language still living after all the attacks on it. The self-respect, the aspirations were always real and always difficult, but you don't live for centuries under the power of others and the same people. It is this always that is hard to admit for it can be made to sound like betrayal. 
genuine identity, a real tradition, a natural respect can be made to stand on their own as if nothing else had ever happened. What is it that has happened? It's nothing surprising. It is in general very well known. To the extent that we are a people, we have been defeated, colonized, penalized, incorporated, never finally, of course. The living resilience in many forms has always been there. But its forms are distinct. They do not really include, for example, the fighting hate of some of the Irish. There is a drawing back to some of our own resources. Real independence, a time of new and active creation. People sure enough of themselves to discard their baggage, knowing the past has passed as a shaping history, but with a new confident sense of the present and the future, where the decisive meanings and values will be made. But at an earlier stage, wanting that but not yet able to get it, there is another spirit, a fixation on the past, part real, part mythologized, because the past in either form is one thing they can't take away from us. A friend from the north of England said to me recently that the Welsh and the Scots were lucky to have these national self-definitions, to help them find their way out of the dominance of English ruling class minority culture. In the north, he said, we who are English are in the same sense denied. What the world knows as English is not our life and feelings, and yet we don't, like the Welsh or the Scots, have this simple thing, this national difference, to pit against it. Then you might get through quicker to the real differences, the real conflicts, I said. No, he said, to get energy to do what you need, to do that, you need the model. I still don't agree altogether, but it is how we might look at it. People have to, in the end, direct their own lives, control their own places, live their own feelings. When this is denied them in any degree, distortions, myths, fancy dress can spread and become epidemic. But to define what is denied them, so as to see it and change it, that is something different and difficult. You need all the help you can get, and the doubtful help is the problem. As Welsh culture changes, and as on the whole it gets stronger, it is this living complexity which we must come, are perhaps coming, to understand, to possess, and to work with. Thank you very much indeed, David. Fantastic. Next up is Sarah Lowndes, um, writer, curator and lecturer, Sarah Lowndes. Sarah, are you there? Yeah. Welcome. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we can hear um, you. Go so, ahead. Yeah, great. So I've chosen to read The Beginning of Culture is Ordinary from 1958. I think part of the reason I chose to read this um, was because I liked the way it's told from the perspective of somebody on the bus. Um, I was looking by way of contrast at the Richard Hoggart book, The Uses of Literacy, where he talks, it's published the year before, 1957, where he talks about the hedonistic but passive barbarian who rides in a 50 horse power bus for three pence. Whereas I really like the way in the Raymond Williams text, he talks about somebody who's on the bus. I was somebody who traveled by bus a lot when I was a child and a teenager. And I think, although I'm obviously Scottish and a woman, I also really relate to Raymond Williams' deep familiar knowledge of a place, partly seen through the windows of a bus. In my case, it was a place where I was born and grew up was Edinburgh. But I also really relate to the way that he explains an understanding of the shaping of minds that had gone on in previous generations in my case, from my mother to my grandmother, and how, although we speak in different idioms, we did think of the same things. Okay, so Raymond Williams' culture is ordinary. The bus stop was outside the cathedral. I'd been looking at the Mappa Mundi with its rivers out of paradise and at the chained library where a party of clergymen had got in easily, but where I had waited an hour and cajoled a verger before I even saw the chains. Now across the street, a cinema advertised the 6-5 special and a cartoon version of Gulliver's Travels. The bus arrived with a driver and a conductress deeply absorbed in each other. We went out of the city over the old bridge and on through the orchards and the green meadows and the fields red under the plough. Ahead were the black mountains and we climbed among them, watching the steep fields end at the grey walls beyond which the bracken and heather and wind had not yet been driven back. 
To the east, along the ridge, stood the line of grey Norman castles. To the west, the fortress wall of the mountains. And then, as we still climbed, the rock changed under us. Here now was limestone and the line of the early iron workings along the scarp. The farming valleys with their scattered white houses fell away behind. Ahead of us were the narrower valleys, the steel rolling mill, the gas works, the gray terraces, the pit heads. The bus stopped and the driver and the conductors got out still absorbed. They had done this journey so often and seen all its stages. It is a journey, in fact, that in one form or another we have all made. I was born and grew up halfway along that bus journey. Where I lived is still a farming valley, though the road through it has been widened and straightened to carry the heavy lorries to the north. Not far away, my grandfather, and so back through the generations, worked as a farm labourer until he was turned out of his cottage and in his fifties became a roadman. His sons went at 13 or 14 onto the farms, his daughters into service. My father, his third son, left the farm at 15 to be a boy porter on the railway and later became a signalman, working in a box in this valley until he died. I went up the road to the village school where a curtain divided the two classes, second to eight or nine, first, to 14. At 11, I went to the local grammar school and later to Cambridge. Culture is ordinary. That is where we must start. To grow up in that country was to see the shape of a culture and its modes of change. I could stand on the mountains and look north to the farms and the cathedral or south to the smoke and the flare of the blast furnace making a second sunset. To grow up in that family was to see the shaping of minds, the learning of new skills, the shifting of relationships, the emergence of different language and ideas. My grandfather, a big hard labourer, wept when he spoke finally and excitedly at the parish meeting of being turned out of his cottage. My father, not long before he died, spoke quietly and happily of when he had started a trade union branch and a Labour Party group in the village and without bitterness of the kept men of the new politics. I speak a different idiom, but I think of these same things. Culture is ordinary. That is the first fact. Every human society has its own shape, its own purposes, its own meanings. Every human society expresses these in institutions and in arts and learning. The making of a society is the finding of common meanings and directions, and its growth is an active debate and amendment under the pressures of experience, contact and discovery, writing themselves into the land. The growing society is there, yet it is also made and remade in every individual mind. The making of a mind is first the slow learning of shapes, purposes and meanings, so that work, observation and communication are possible. Then, second but equal in importance is the testing of these in experience, the making of new observations, comparisons and meanings. A culture has two aspects, the known meanings and directions which its members are trained to, the new observations and meanings which are offered and tested. These are the ordinary processes of human societies and human minds and we see through them the nature of a culture that is always both traditional and creative, that it is both the most ordinary common meanings and the finest individual meanings. We use the word culture in these two senses to mean a whole way of life, the common meanings, to mean the arts and learning, the special processes of discovery and creative effort. Some writers reserve the word for one or other of these senses, I insist on both and on the significance of their conjunction. The questions I ask about our culture are questions about our general and common purposes, yet also questions about deep personal meanings. Culture is ordinary in every society and in every mind. Thank you so much, Sarah. And just to say to everybody, Sarah's produced a really, um, fascinating, interesting, a lovely explainer 
Raymond Williams Explainer for the Raymond Williams Foundation, which is on our website on Raymond Williams and Community. So if you want to check that after, please do so. Um, next, we're really privileged and delighted to have with us um, Gwydion Maldark Williams, who's an author, um, the creator of the Long Revolution 21st Century Socialism website, and of course, the Raymond Williams, one of Raymond Williams' sons. Are you there, Gwydion? Yes, uh, yes, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you loud and clear. Welcome. Thanks. As an author, actually, I wrote something, an account of Adam Smith, which is, I think, the only left-wing criticism, but it's, it hasn't had much circulation, unfortunately. People don't seem to want to know it anyway. Well, I was um, reading some bits from key words about democracy, because often we use words and we get confused by the meanings, and we often get swamped by the, by the meaning that uh, the sort of official media try to put on them, and democracy in particular. Um, just, uh, yeah, we just, we're told that, Af that democracy has just been overthrown in Afghanistan, but I say it never actually existed. There were elections, but they just voted in the local elite and the people were not much connected, which is why most of them didn't care to die to resist the Taliban, even though I don't think they mostly agreed. Anyway, what, what my father said on this, um, for democracy, it is a very old word, but its meaning has always been complex. I have to skip a lot, it's too long, right. This range of uses um, can, however, be, be said at uh, several of these uses, and especially those which indicate a form of popular cl class rule, are uh, at some distance from any orthodox modern Western definition of democracy. Uh, Uh, with only occasional exceptions, democracy, in the records we have, was until the 19th century a strongly unfavorable term. Um, acquiring us to find democracy's popular power, where the ordinary people, by force of numbers, govern, oppressed, the rich, the whole population acting like a tyrant. The strong class sense remained a predominant meaning until the 18th and 19th century, and is still at. Um, two modern meanings of, of democracy can be seen to diverge. In the socialist tradition, democracy continued to mean popular power, a state in which the interests of the majority of the people were paramount, and in which these interests were practiced, practically exercised and controlled in, by, the, by the majority. In the liberal tradition, democracy means open election of representatives and certain conditions, and democratic rights, free speech, which are maintained um, uh, yes, there's the Leninist thing about bourgeois democracy. If the predominant criteria in elections is free speech, uh, other criteria are seen as secondary or rejected. An attempt to exercise popular power in the popular interest, um, as a sample in the general strike, uh, is described as anti democratic. Um, Okay, I see. I'll leave it. Uh, can I just? Yeah, I'll leave it at that. Okay, there's, there's a lot more. You can read the whole thing. I hope you do. Okay. Sorry, I, I pressed. Sorry, I think yes. I, I think leave it at that. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you very much, indeed. Um, next, we have Mary Joni. Mary is um, Emer Emeritus Professor of Liter Literary History and Women's Writing at Angela Ruskin University. And she's also the chair of the Raymond Williams Foundation. Mary, can I hand over to you? Thank you. I'm an Emeritus Professor, not an Emeritus. And it's a pleasure to follow him from a dork, and I shall certainly read the whole thing, and a pleasure to develop the things that Sarah's said about community. So what I'm going to read from is The Country and the City. And it's a piece I always loved because it locates the, one, the moment when Raymond Williams made me think about Jane Austen in a way I've never uh, thought about her before and deepened, you know, uh, and changed my whole understanding. And what this piece is about is noble community. I'm reading from the chapter called Noble Community and also three around uh, Farnham. 
And of course, we love community. We've had so much community during lockdown. That whole sense of neighbourliness, of looking after other people, of it not being me, me, me. But Raymond Williams also made us think about the noble community. And the noble community is much more problematic and it is much more challenging. And it is actually making us think about social media, communications, you know, all those seeds he laid about what community includes as well as what it excludes. And it's more important than ever in an age of social media where we are fragmented, atomized in bubbles and in WhatsApp groups to say, who is our community? Who does it include and who does it exclude? Does it include all those posh houses out the road with gates and burglar alarms? Does it include all those kids coming into my lovely green area and, you know, dropping dog poo and leaving litter and, you know, making a load of noise on their transistors? Is that my community? So here we are. Jane Austen, Country in the City, and the Knowable Community. Look back for a moment at the Knowable Community of Jane Austen. Uh, we, it is an actual community very precisely selected. Neighbours in Jane Austen are not the actual people living nearby. Um, they're the people living a little less nearby, who in social recognition can be visited. What she sees across the land is a network of propertied houses and families, and through the holes of the tightly drawn mesh, most actual people are simply not seen. To be face to face in this world, is already to belong to a class. No other community in physical presence or in social reality is in any means knowable. There's not named most of the people who've disappeared in a stylized convention as precise as Ben Johnson's. It's also most of the country, which becomes and only as it relates to the houses, which are the real modes for the new, for the, for most of the country, is weather or a place to walk. Okay. Three about farming. She's, for example, more exact about income, which is disposable, than about acres, which have to be worked. But at the same time, she sees land in a way that does she not see other sources of income. Her eye for house, for timber, for the details of improvement is quick, accurate, monetary. Yet money of other kinds, from the trading houses, from the colonial plantations, has no visual equivalent. It has to be converted to those signs of order to be recognized at all. The land is seen primarily as an index of revenue and positions. Its visible order and control are a valued product, while the process of working it is hardly seen at all. Jane Austen often reminds us, yet again, of the two meanings of improvement, which were historically linked, but in practice so contradictory. There is the improvement of soil, stocks, yields in a working agriculture. And there is the improvement of houses, parks, artificial landscapes, which absorbed as much of the actual increasing wealth. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Mary. Thank you so much. And not the penultimate um, reader now. I'm very, very happy to be able to welcome Josie Sparrow. Josie's um, writer and editor of New Socialist. Josie, I'd like to hand over to you now. Thank you. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Yep. Wonderful, wonderful. So, so I've chosen um, the extract, the edited extract that I was going to read from Williams's 1982 essay, Socialism and Ecology. And I've chosen this for a few reasons. Firstly, because I believe that Williams as an ecological thinker is massively under-recognized. And secondly, because the section I'll be reading from focuses both critically and generatively on William Morris, another overlooked socialist thinker with much to teach us, both in terms of where he was right and where he got it wrong, which Williams really, really brings out with characteristic sensitivity. And my third reason is um, that this essay is precisely as old as me. And yet many of the questions and problems which it poses continue and persist. Um, the full essay, we've been lucky enough to republish it at New Socialist and I'll drop a link in the chat afterwards so everyone can read it in full rather than my kind of like slightly sort of borderized version of it. So here we go, take it away Ray. William Morris was at once a socialist, indeed a revolutionary socialist, and a man who from direct practice, from the use of his own hands, from the observation of natural processes, was deeply aware of what work on physical objects really means. He knew that you can produce ugliness quite as easily as you can create beauty. He knew that you can produce the useless or the damaging just as easily as the useful. He could see how many kinds of work seemed specifically designed to create ugliness and damage in their making and in their use. He thought about this not only in general ways, but from his own practice as a craftsman. His critique of the abstract idea of production was one of the most decisive interventions in the socialist argument. Instead of the simple capitalist quantum of production, he began asking questions about what kinds of production. Morris said, have nothing in your home which you do not either believe to be beautiful or know to be useful. It sounds a trite recommendation, but it goes to the center of the problem and to take it seriously still today would lead to a pretty extraordinary clear out. And it's not just in the home. Suppose we said, have nothing in your shops but what you believe to be beautiful or know to be useful. That is a criterion of production which, instead of a simple quantitative reckoning, is relating production to human need. Moreover, it sees human need as something more than consumption, that incredibly popular idea of our own time, which from the dominance of capitalist marketing and advertising, tries to reduce all human need and desire to consumption. It is an extraordinary word, consumer. It is a way of seeing people as though they are either stomachs or furnaces. Moreover, if you have a notion of production, which is to supply that kind of consumption, you can only think in quantitative terms. You can never really ask, do we have to accept certain losses, certain local damages because we need this production? You cannot ask whether we need this or that production because of use or beauty. Production becomes insensibly an end in itself as in ordinary capitalist thinking, but also within a strain of socialist thinking in which it is seen as in itself and as such the answer to poverty. So when Morris brought these questions together and campaigned over so many issues, he was making the kind of junction of two different traditions, which ought to have come earlier, ought to have been better sustained after Morris and ought to be much clearer and stronger than it is even today. And one reason why this is not the case is that Morris was a victim of the common delusion that before factory production, before industrial and mechanical production, there had been a natural, clean, simple order. Morris, it was located as for so many 19th century radicals and socialists in the Middle Ages. Just 
a notion that the socialist future would be some kind of reconstitution of the medieval world established itself deeply in his thought, although it always worried him. He conceded that if a machine would save us from boring work, then we should use it. But the main tendency was always towards the reconstitution of an essentially simple peasant and craftsman order. Now, I don't have to tell you how strong that kind of thinking still is within the ecological movement. It is seen by many good people as the only way of saving the world. But for everyone else, Morris seems easy to dismiss because in that 21st century world he imagined after the socialist revolution of 1952, which I don't need to remind you was a bit off the date, in that world, you've got a small, clean London in which more or less everything happens easily and naturally. If you feel like doing something, then you do it, because in any case, there's enough. Yet all this sufficiency happens, happens somewhere mysteriously off stage. And back by the river, there is only the visual beauty, the sensitivity of friendship and comradeship. There is a pervading sense of leisure and space and peace where all the human values can be sustained and developed. But that's it. It is a sweet, spacious, clean little world where the problems of production have not just been questioned, but have been pushed out of sight. Morris was right to observe towards the end of his life that he probably thought and imagined in that way because he was himself born rich by inheritance and was always able as a marvelous craftsman to earn a good living by doing the kind of satisfying work that other people actually wanted done. Rich people, incidentally, were the only customers who could afford to buy craftsmanship of his quality. He said that all that probably pillared his views. Well, yes, it did. It is an honest admission. And this is one of the tangles that we have to sort out. Thank you so much, thank you. Thank you, Josie. That was wonderful. Really lovely. Um, we have one final reader, Patrick Jones. Patrick's had a bit of trouble with his connection. So <laughs> Hello. can you hear me, Patrick? Yeah, can I can hear, hear you. you. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can't see you, but that's fine. That's, as long as we can hear you. That's <laughs> great. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, yeah, some beautiful readings. Um, I, I just wanted to do a small contribution. And um and I was thinking how I was introduced to the work of Raymond Williams, and I, I, owe, a, I owe a great debt to a university lecture from Swansea University when I went there as a very naive 18-year-old from the Valleys, um, and I, I was a bit over, overwhelmed by everything, and I did sociology, and her name was uh, Dr. Hilary Stanworth, and she gave me a great reading list and um, uh, I couldn't afford all the books so I used to go down the library I don't know if anyone knows Swans University Library it's a lovely <laughs> little hideaway and you can see the sea and looking out and I used to go down there and, and um, I, uh, she gave me a list of like Paulo pa pa <laughs> Fiera Pedagogy of the Oppressed and Raymond Williams Culture and Society was two of the books that she directed me to. And I would go down there and 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 just devour them really. I didn't understand everything of that because I was, you know, I said I was more interested in playing football in those days. <laughs> um, but 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 it I just liked the reality of the words. And I, I think also I think then it's only when I went into the world of work that I really understood a lot of Ray Raymond Williams's work. And I I taught uh, adult literacy. In, in that class up in the in, in Blackwood, um, uh, which was a which a, which a fantastic experience of about you know the the orderliness of culture and and the the, the power that that is being that was being denied us our voices. So sorry, that was my in, little introduction just to say that's where it started many years ago. And um, I, I've just got two short quotes, um, which I to me they, they felt quite resonant to today's world that we're living in. The first one was from 1975. Real independence is a time of new and active creation. People sure enough of themselves to discard their baggage, knowing the past is past, as shaping history, but with a new confident sense of the present and the future, where the decisive meanings and values will be made. And the second one, um, 
I think Sharon actually said this right at the beginning, but it was my little quote as well, which I wanted to end with. I, I really, this, this is this beautiful, uh, uh, such a simple but profound uh, statement, and I think it's really relevant today. To be truly radical is to make hope possible rather than despair convincing. And if anyone has ever dipped into the sidebar of the Daily Mail, you know how important it is for us to, to find hope these days and, um, and the way the world is. So that's my contribution. Thank you for uh, yeah, having me here. Cheers. Thank you so much, Patrick. That's the poet and author Patrick Jones. Um, I'm glad we could connect with you, Patrick. Thank you, yeah. We didn't lose the connection. <laughs> um, what a wonderful selection. Um, and what is great to have this collective listening exercise. I'm not sure, it'd be great to hear what Rain would have made of this um, technology um, that's enabling us to get together and collectively listen to these, this, this and enable a disparate group all over the country to um, come together on his centenary in this way. Um, the breadth and depth of, those, of Raymond's work comes across incredibly powerfully just from that very tiny collection of his extracts, um, given his enormous body of work. But I think they were a great selection and it gave us a real um, taste of his work. Um, Sharon, I'm going to hand over to Sharon to um, for chair the next section of the evening, which is the, we're going to have a chance to discuss uh, um, his work now. Sharon, you'll, I'll hand over to you now. Thank you, Sharon. Yeah, thanks, Nick. And fantastic readings, incredibly powerful. And I've just been copiously jotting notes all the time. And it's great that people are already sharing their readings. Um, We've got a couple of key questions that we want to use more as a stimulus, really, to discuss what we've, we've heard. Um, obviously, with 80 odd people, it's always difficult to do this in the way we might like, which we would in a big room, but we're not in that physical space at the moment. So um, we'd be grateful if you could kind of literally put your hand up or use the hand icon. That would be fantastic if you want to contribute in person or you can write any comments and thoughts and ideas in the chat function. But Nick and I have conceived of two questions that we'd like to put to you for this last uh, section of our, of our session today. So really we want to think about what resonated from the readings and feels most relevant to now. And secondly, in what ways might we want to build or might we actually build on this body of work in the years ahead? So um, I'm gonna open up to the floor and um, be grateful if people can contribute um, or offer their thoughts either way, chat or in person. Um, Sharon, I Chad was waving first, Chad Goodwin. Okay, brilliant, Chad, over to you. Um, I found it very striking um, that we've had a number of Welsh contributors this evening and the sense of culture, like, and in many ways, the differences between English and Welsh culture. And I, I don't want to get into that too much, but um, I, I had the experience of living and working in mid Wales myself for five years in the 1970s. Um, this was in mid Wales, not uh, anywhere near Pandy. Um, but that sense of community was very powerful and very strong. And I, you know, that, that really did influence me at the time. And, and so when you look back at Williams's life and in, in reading more about it in, in preparation for the course I'm doing on him, this has become more apparent that that background, that sense of community, that sense of solidarity is such an important part of, of his whole life, really, and, and his whole writings. I think that's really quite striking. And given that the way we've been thinking, you know, since the Thatcherite years and so on, and the fragmentation of society and, and all of the rest of it, that to me, actually in, in many ways, is, is the main message that Raymond Williams gives us, that you can't let go of that. If you lose that sense of community and solidarity, you are lost, basically. 
And, and that's what I find so powerful about so many of his writings in, in so many mm. different aspects. But you know, that, that I, I, I do feel I have a connection with that, having lived in Wales myself, yeah, not for very long. Um, but um, I, 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 I sort of, you know, you asked about the resonance of, of what we've been hearing, and that's the mm. resonance I get. And, and I, I, I do think that that sense of community, solidarity, and then where he went from that with adult education, its importance and all this, it all fits. It's all part of that same thing about solidarity and supporting each other. Yeah, that's it for me. So. Thank you, Chad. Yeah, associationism. Yeah, really yeah. important. Anybody want to follow on from that? So I can't see hands or anything. So Claire's kindly letting me know. Any of the speakers, any of the readers would like to chip in? Yeah. I'm sure you must, yeah. Hi, Sarah, yeah. Well, yeah, just to say, I think um, one of the things I find most interesting is not just the idea of community, but this idea about modes of change. So in the extract that I read, I found it really interesting that he spoke about his grandfather as a labourer and then as his father as a Labour Party um, organiser. And you know, in terms of my own personal history, he encourages you to think about how different members of your own family might have thought one thing, that idea grows through the next generation, the next generation. So it's not merely just being connected, it's mm -hmm. also a development of ideas as well. And that's what I find really interesting is that we'll all have people in our families who have slightly different politics, but maybe that politics developed over many years. And that's the thing that I really like about his vision. It's quite a, a long sweep, it's quite a deep history. And I also really like the way that he talks about it being written in the land mm. and in his very intelligent understanding of the relationship between the country and the city or the interrelationship. So I just I just love the way that he, he maps that very wide web of associations and always in a really sort of positive develop, developing sense, yeah. Thank you very much, Sarah. Yeah, absolutely. I like that phrase living complexity earlier on as well. You know, that sense of networks of thinking as well, um, which connects to the land and the people. Um, and the idea that it's not just about fancy dress, it's about it's about reality and um, real experience and how that influences the next generation um, and the people around you. Yeah, thank you. That's really helpful. Anybody else want to come in? Um, Stephen Yeo, I've seen. Excellent. Stephen, over to you. Hello. Hello. And thank you very much for these wonderful extracts. Complexity, yes, but what came across to me from the readings and the way that they were done is that Raymond's language was direct, intelligible, clear, sim and simple is slightly the wrong word, but um, complex in its meaning, but, but clear in its utterance. And I just want to say that because what I've just said is by no means usually or always true of writing from the left. Yes. Um, and um, sometimes his fiction, Raymond's fiction, which I think is really, really good and interesting, was seen as being in some sense like Thomas Hardy's poetry as being clumsy or naive or too direct, not modern. And you can see a lovely clash, which I would even see as a class conflict mm. between, between some of the interviewers in politics and letters and some of Raymond's responses to what is being put to him. He's sometimes put down in a very um, unrude and polite way uh, what was being suggested to him, just as he did sometimes with uh, um, writings uh, about and against or critical of Edward Thompson's wonderful work. 
Edward Thompson's review of The Long Revolution is an extremely interesting but rather rude piece applied in a very, I don't know, honourable, direct, unfashionable, <laughs> in a funny kind of way, yeah. And I, this came, it really came, his lucidity came across to me very strongly this evening. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, yeah, we've got some some great questions emerging in the chat as well, which kind of develop um, that point as well. I'm, I'm really interested if anyone would be willing or would, would like to take on the task of talking a little about structure of feeling. Um, this is a profound um, preoccupation of my own, and I'm not going to, going to attempt to do it myself. Uh, but um, I did read Daniel Hartley's fantastic um, Facebook post earlier today. I don't know if anyone else saw it on the centenary. And um, he made some fantastic uh, observations about structure feeling. But before, before I unleash that particular quote, does anyone want to take on... Um, one of the speakers is one of sorry one of our participants has asked about structure of feelings specifically I'd be very grateful if anyone wants to respond on that big ask i know anyone <laughs> hi uh, th this is David Lusted. I'm up in the top left-hand box here. Hi, David. Hi. I mean, I, I think structure of feeling is one of the most elusive concepts that Williams ever offered. And I've tended to, <laughs> over the years to kind of let it drift to the margins of my thoughts about him. Uh, I, I actually attended a, a, um, a talk once of his uh, where he was taking apart uh, a, a, a biographer of the BBC, I can't even remember the man's name, uh, in the most politest but fundamentally destructive way, uh, and left the poor man a gibbering mass at, at the end. <laughs> and I thought, well, what, what, how does this relate to structure of feeling, is what I was, I was thinking. Because clearly, for Williams, it was an important concept. It was a crucial one, and it's linked to so many of the, the themes that have come through the talks today about community, about roots, uh, about biography. Yeah. Uh, but on the other hand, when he applies it to political ideas and especially crucially to literature, I, I think it loses any real sense of meaning. And I'll throw that in because if there is anybody out there that can define it more carefully, I would be happy to hear it. Mm. Can I ask anyone else who, who would, if anyone would like to come in? Um, if not, I've got, um, I, I did think that, as I was saying, Daniel's piece today is kind of revelatory and, and really helpful for me in unpicking what structure of feeling means. Um, in terms of class consciousness as well and, and um, issues around culture and class. Yeah, anyone, um, anyone want to come in on structure of feeling? Please do. Okay, um, if no one wants to come in right this second, I just read this very briefly, if you don't mind, just one second, I'll just find it. Um, so in, in, um, in, in uh, Daniel's post, um, he says, Williams would transpose many insights from his work on drama into theoretical concepts, not least that of structure of feeling, which developed largely out of his work on problems of speech in naturalist drama. The fact that a register of everyday verisimilitude struggles to attain the full range of human motion, emotion at moments of dramatic intensity Many of the deepest motivations and feelings are left unsaid, merely hinted at or transferred onto all encompassing symbols. These unspoken depths are often the locations of our deepest commitments, such that to ignore them, as he accused much orthodox Mar Marxist theory of having done, is to risk political defeat. I just thought that was a really powerful and, and interesting point. 
He goes on to say that um, obviously Thomas Hardy was very much considered to be outside the great tradition by Leavis and others in, in English literature. And, um, and you know, talks about Henry James quote, basically condescendingly describing him as the good little Thomas Hardy. Um, and he, he really goes on, William saw in that, um, Hart, Dave, Daniel says, um, that there's a split between an educated idiom with which he could think but not feel and a customary style rooted in the rural working class whose effective depths he channeled, but which was inadequate for advanced intellectual speculation. I think that's really interesting. So he says anyone who's moved between working class and bourgeois worlds will know the internal divisions and crises it can bring about. So uh, yeah, and I, I can put the, the post in by the way, um, after, we've, uh, after we've finished, but yeah, don't know if anyone, that sparks any thoughts and it really resonated with me, the power of that kind of um, st structure of feeling in connection with uh, class and culture specifically and about effective language. Yes, Stephen. Do we, do we have to um, remember that structure and structuralisms were much about, and I think the sense of a contending left was quite important to Raymond, and and I think that to, um, as it were, drag structure to allow f structure into feeling, yes, rather than keeping it for reason. Yes. I think was in itself something important to appropriate it away from structuralists and structuralisms, which were parading themselves with great power and complexity on the left. I think this was an important thing in itself hmm? to bring yes, those two words together. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. I've got uh, Aileen who I think wants to come in, Aileen Delane. Um, hi everybody, can you hear me okay? So um, I'm an ethnomusicologist, uh, an anthropologist of music, and I came to Raymond Williams through my University of Chicago supervisor, Martin Stokes. He's based in um, King's College in London now, and he's from the Welsh borderlands. And so uh, I read um, a lot of Williams during my dissertation, and I guess uh, I think the thing that I would like uh, you to know if you haven't you know, come across this already in the music world uh, and in the ethnomusicology and popular music studies, uh, Williams's take on class and culture um, is very, very profound. And when it comes to ideas of structures of feeling, this is something people have imported in relation, not just simply to genre, uh, but also to social imaginaries. So that when we uh, dissect or take apart expressions of music and uh, collective performance and the affective dimensions of those things, uh, Williams can be um, uh, applied in very kind of productive and creative ways. And I think that's one of his greatest uh, legacies, as is uh, his uh, focus on the artist, both, both as an aesthetic um, personhood, but also as uh, a political maverick. So the idea of the protest singer or the manner in which uh, music not just reflects, but also predicts society. Um, as Jacques Attai you would say. So an amazing event. I'm privileged to be listening to you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, that's, that's great. Does anyone else want to follow on from Aileen's contribution? It's really interesting to hear it applied as well in that very different context, um, but also one that connects directly with literature in so many ways. Uh, can I just... Add something, yeah, about structural feeling. Yeah. I, hello to everybody. My name is Alexandrina. I'm a sociologist, and uh, I actually tried to apply the concept of structural feeling in my research of working class life and struggle in post Soviet Russia. And uh, surprisingly, uh, this concept appeared to be applicable to post Soviet. Um, uh, context because uh, when we talk about structures of feeling, um, we can think in terms of residual uh, structures and emergent structures. And when we think about transition from Soviet to post-Soviet, then we can uh, observe some convergences and um, um, 
some conflicts between different structures. And uh, in my research, I define structural feeling as um, an effective or emotive principle which regulates um, uh, everyday life of um, um, city dwellers and uh, residents of working class neighborhoods. So that's how I try to apply it. And uh, on the one hand, we can say that it's uh, that this concept is very slippery. But on the other hand, I think that it is an open co concept and uh, uh, it has some explanatory power. But the, uh, the thing is that we should uh, define it when we apply it in empirical research. And uh, yeah, so that's what I wanted to add. Thank you very much, Alexandrina. And I think that's interesting because um, there's been a few really helpful uh, comments in the chat. And uh, Janet, I think, Baxley has said, it's to do with how culture leads and feelings emerge, perhaps ahead of the verbalization in, in, in politics or in other forms for that matter, and uh, relates it to the choir in the first reading, which I think is interesting. Uh, Sarah says, one of William's most influential and persuasive ideas was the way in which he described communities as structures of feeling that persisted, developed, and were expressed through words and actions. And I think that's really important. As he explained, culture is common meaning, meanings, the products, the product of a whole people. And he places further emphasis on culture as being alive in the chapter structure of feelings in his book, Marxism and Literature, which is my favorite um, piece of writing myself uh, by, by Williams. Um, yeah, so please do read these comments. They're really, really helpful. Um, and does anyone want to add further? I'm just trying to sit, scroll down the chat. Forgive me, doing my best. <laughs> um, so Tom, yes, sorry. Yeah, please do. Just to say as well, the going back to the choir where um, Colin was it who was reading it was was touching his head and and feeling it in his body and when we think about residual we might think of the choir as a residual form it's an old form it's not a, a very contemporary form but at the moment if you think about Williams and Resources of Hope we can also think that that affect that Colin was communicating to us gives us a resource of hope, even if it's um, something from the past, something from that we may feel nostalgic in relation to. <coughs> um, and I find that a really powerful um, resource, actually, for understanding the depth, really, of, of um, what we need to draw on in order to resist the dominant forms, yeah. Thank you. Um, this, yeah, I'm just trying to um, follow up your points, Janet, with, with, with comments in the chat as well that kind of relate to what you're saying. Um, and yeah, it's a really, um, it is really, somebody said, this is a kind of hive minding experience, <laughs> trying to work together collectively, which is a lovely feeling, I must say, to try and think about, what we mean by this very tricky concept in real time. And I think that's absolutely right. So yeah, does anyone want to follow on from Janet's comments? This is really interesting and helpful. Um, I'm not doing justice to all the chat comments because frankly, I, I, I can't seem to do all of them at, um, at the same time. So does anyone want to talk about uh, emergent cultural formations, which is something Alexandrine has talked about the class position that we've alluded to, um, issues about language that we've alluded to. And um, an interesting point, I think, I'm just trying to see who it's from, um, from Ben Vidal Kaufman, um, who said, overall, the topic seems to point to a broader, important aspect of William's thought in his profound interest in and belief in the importance of, um, <clears throat> hang on, um, I've lost it. It's my, uh, oh yes, okay. Um, in his proud interest and belief in the importance of moving beyond an overbearing epochal focus in Marxist thought towards the possibilities and agency of emergent cultural formations, which was Alexandrina's point. This seems to emerge 
and be an important point against those condescensions, if you like, of the 30s Marxist tradition that you found himself in Cambridge. Yeah, very, very interesting point. Okay, we can move on from structure feeling if we don't want to continue hive minding. Does anyone want to, to move on, pick up a different point or from the readings? Or importantly, our second question about the importance of Williams's work for our continuing development and, and thought processes. No, I'm, I'm waving like mad to Sharon at the moment. Sorry, yes, can't see anything like that. <laughs> Apologies, <laughs> Chad. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, because we're getting towards the end, um, th there's been so many interesting things that have come out this evening, as one would expect, you know. Um, but at the end, I, I tend to think whenever I'm trying to say something about Raymond Williams or, you know, teaching around him, um, you end up with this phrase, resources of hope. Mm. And, and, and I, 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 I just find that incredibly significant. And that he did, you know, all of the time he was, he was trying to put across this message that there are possibilities there and we can do it. And this is what's behind the long revolution, culture is ordinary, the whole thing, it all fits together. And it's all about moving forward together in solidarity as a community, I think. And I, I, I would just like to sort of throw this out, you know, this evening. Um, is that how we feel? Because, you know, as, you know, this, this quote we're always using about, you know, making hope possible rather than despair convincing. Mm. Um, and I think we all seem to have that in our mind at the moment with the centenary and with this, you know, bloody awful situation that we're in at the moment as well. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm just very curious to sort of just throw that out and see if anyone wants to respond to it. Yeah. Because I, 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 I do feel very strongly that's one of the most important aspects of Raymond Williams, that that's what he's always trying to do. He's trying to make you feel hopeful. You can do things. We can work together. We can do this. No. Thank you. Thanks very much, Chad. Yeah, that's something that's been very important to myself. I've got a couple of people. Um, I think Joseph wants to ask a question. Can I come to you on camera, please, Joseph? And Steph's got a, an ask as well. Right. Am I? Am I? Yes, you're there. You're no. there. OK, I, you. I actually wanted to draw away from uh, what we've been talking about. So if everyone That's wants... That's OK. Yeah, we've community got... community says, get out, you know, fair enough. But I did want to just mention, I mean, we are talking about the life of Raymond Williams, I think, and his and the meaning of that life, I think, is that is one thing that he was actually... His employment, his work, was in academia in different ways. Um, and he was a teacher. Um, the point I actually wanted to make was that if you watch one or two of the interviews that have been conducted with him, he comes up with something incredibly, to me anyway, incredibly unusual, which is that he seems able to do, as it were, instant lecture. If he was a musician, you'd be saying, well, play us a tune and he can play anything at any time, which is really quite, um, which I think is quite admirable. And I think he comes over as much more than what today would be seen as an academic, as somebody very much set and sort of molded and pressed. And I'm not mm. sure what an, those who are, who are still in that have the misfortune to still be in academic <laughs> employment. Um, no, no, it's a factual. Um, what in fact he'd make of the world today with all the expectations and so on, although there were, there were, there were some good things about that in a way, but he, to me, he had a much wider role than simply going through the motions in Cambridge for over 20, 20 years and becoming a public intellectual, which yeah. I don't think there's very, there's that many examples of his kind of totally. commitment today. And yeah. I think he's, um, he, he wanted to be a novelist and a filmmaker in a way. I'm rather glad he didn't do so much of that, that he became really an, an, an essayist 
and he mm. seems like those essays watching the interviews i'm thinking has someone set all this up beforehand because they just the, the thoughts tumble out but they tumble out in such lucid form and i think for many of us who've been lecturers uh, sadly uh, in the past um one would one wishes one had that level of lucidity and i think that's that's um, that's admirable and a quality that not many people have had. And I'm curious to know um, where that, in a way, where that all came from. Um, so that's all, that's all I would say on that. Well, thank you, Joseph. That's a really, really good point, I think. I mean, I think, uh, I don't know if people have seen the Tribune article that Philip, Philip O'Brien, um, who's, who's also hosting the film shortly at nine, has, has written that's been published today. That, that, that makes that point, that he seemed to be able to extemporise um, and, and almost give birth to new, new pieces of thought and new pieces of thing, uh, new, new, um, new essays almost, spoken essays. Um, and that he formulated his ideas often in conversation. I, I think that's a fantastic um, kind of what you've just said, you know, observation really. Yeah, thank you very much, Joseph. Um, Steph, you wanted to say something or you wanted to ask something? I'm just- yeah. hi, Sharon, thank you. Hi. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was just really interested in, in the end of what Chad was saying about resources of hope. But in line with what Rhiannon was talking about, in line with duty, and then thinking back to Patrick's use of the quote, and it would just be a plea to have another discussion later with some of the creatives in Wales around duty, instrumentalization of duty, and hope, and how to keep those things simple. So I just, mm -hmm. just a plea to Patrick and Rhiannon to maybe get involved in some discussion on that. I would love that. It's not the time now, but it would be really interesting to hear. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And um, I noted your comments about resilience earlier, Steph. Sorry, we didn't get to look at that. But, um, you know, that's such a such a freighted word at the moment, isn't it? And one I, I ball cap, but I think it, it, it's worthy of a, of a more de a de deeper and more detailed conversation. Thanks, Sharon. Um, I think young practitioners wanting to hear these things. and get Yeah, them. absolutely. We do need these conversations, definitely. Well, I hope this is inspired some further thoughts really um, from our speakers and from the people who've been participating. Um, and we've had a really excellent turn. I'm really delighted people have come along and, and given so much of the time and, and energy this evening. Um, but just, yeah, do we have any final reflections from our speakers before we wrap up and have a break before the film for those who are going into that next? Yes. Mary. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. I was going to say that somebody said it's not just this birthday, we should do it every year. I think that's a lovely idea. But also mm -hmm. I've got a tooth, a toothpaste uh, mug and I was just going to add my own little personal toast to Raymond Williams and a happy birthday. So I don't know if everybody's too cerebral to want to do that. I hope <laughs> not. <laughs> I'm so afraid I haven't got a drink got with me. A mug or a drink or a glass of water, <laughs> perhaps we could finish with a toast to Raymond Williams, to us, and to Resources of Hope. What a lovely thought. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Mary. Yeah. <laughs> so, a glass of water, not very exciting. <laughs> What we reduced to. Yes, what we reduced to. <laughs> Sadly. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone. It's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, and um, and we hope that you'll come along to any subsequent events. We're going to think hard about, well, what the explainers tell us about what interests people have, what have come, what's come out in the chat tonight as well, and um, and do look at the chat before um, before we go. And and also, obviously, Nick and I will make sure it's captured. Uh, I must say a big thank you to Claire White as well, who's helped out on the the tech side tonight um because i'm really crap at that kind of thing and it's it's kept me it's kept me and nick on for and um and you know together organized so many many thanks and thank you claire yeah thanks to everybody for contributing thanks thank everyone you, thanks to all our speakers thank you so much thank you nick